Good evening. Welcome to the 23rd annual John Howard Burst Jr. Memorial keynote event entitled Writing and Political Activism, the work of South African writer Nadine Gordimer. I'm Betsy Peck Learned, Dean of University Library Services at Roger Williams University. And along with my colleague, Professor Adam Braver, Library Program Director, we thank you all so much for coming. Please know this event is being recorded this evening. The John Howard Burst program includes this evening's keynote event and two mm -hmm. exhibitions, a comprehensive virtual exhibition and a smaller physical exhibit mounted in the university library prepared by university archivist Heidi Benedict and honors program student fellows. Adam will put the link in the exhibition um, to the exhibition in the chat and we hope that you'll view it later. It's really quite a, quite a wonderful exhibit. The annual Burst program celebrates a great writer of literature and their body of work. This year's selection, the work of Nadine Gordimer, was selected by the university's Burst Committee with representation from Roger Williams faculty, staff, and a member of the Rogers Free Library staff, which is our public library in Bristol. We're hugely grateful to Robert Blaze, an alumnus of RWU, who with his gift to the university in the year 2000 made this, these events possible. Mr. Blaze's endowment was in honor of his mentor and friend, Professor John Howard Burst Jr., a scholar of Herman Melville, a founder of the Melville Society, and a collector of letters and rare first editions. The Blaze gift supports an exhibition, a library book fund for collecting works related to the exhibit, travel for student fellows to archives and libraries associated with the author, and a keynote event. Tonight's program is a panel discussion, and we're honored to have with us novelist Claire Massoud, New Yorker book critic James Wood, and Robert Boyers, editor-in-chief of Selma Gundy magazine, who has been a key partner in this year's BURST program. With that, I'll hand it over now to Professor Boyers to introduce our panelists in this evening's format. Bob? Great. Thank you very much. Um, a great, deep pleasure to be here tonight with two close friends on this panel. And of course, we're all very grateful to Adam Braver for conceiving of this event. As you know, Nadine Gordon was born 100 years ago in 1923. She was, of course, a South African writer, not only in the sense that she spent her life in that country, but in the sense that most of her fiction is set there. Gordimer found ways to engage consistently with the people and politics of South Africa without ever suggesting that her vision was merely local or parochial. She seemed to us a writer who was interested in everything important to us, wherever we live, whatever our own provincial perspectives. When my old teacher, Conor Cruz O'Brien, wrote of her in the New York Review of Books many years ago, that it is Turgenev she most brings to mind, I couldn't help thinking that for all of his deep immersion in the fabric of Russian life, Turgenev was never merely a Russian writer, any more than Gordimer was merely a recorder of things South African. I liked very much what Joyce Carol Oates said of Gordimer's great novel, Berger's Daughter, that it is a novel of social and political import, which is also an intensely subjective prose poem. Lots to unpack in that insight. My sense is that Gordimer is not as widely read by literary people in this country as she was 20 or 30 years ago. Perhaps that has something to do with the fact that she is no longer bringing out a new novel every few years or publishing stories all the time in The New Yorker or Harper's or my own Selma Gundy. Perhaps it has more to do with other factors, for example, with the fact that South Africa is no longer in the news in the way it was during the apartheid era, or perhaps with the fact that Gorda was always an uncompromising writer whose work is apt to seem especially demanding to readers who want their fiction to be more comforting and confirming. At any rate, we're here this evening to talk about a great writer and to raise questions that will seem useful and provocative. Though we will feel free to travel where we like, we will assume only that at least some of us have read the three short stories that we tried to make available to people attending this session. Eventually, 
uh, the three of us will provide brief summaries of those stories and speak at least a little about them. And we'll use our observations as a springboard for conversation about Gordimer's vision and politics eventually. But now I thought we might begin with a passage from a recent interview with the art critic Jed Pearl, which I thought might sort of prompt our first conversation. Pearl says that when he was working on his own recent book on authority and freedom, he looked at some of Leon Trotsky's ideas about the freedom of the artist. Trotsky believed, Pearl says, that the artist who acted freely was contributing to a deeper understanding of the world we live in and thereby furthering the revolutionary struggle, unquote. According to Trotsky, that's why artistic freedom is worth defending. This view, according to Jed Pearl, has remained enormously appealing. It is unfortunate, Pearl argues, that many of us believe that the artist or writer who isn't offering a response to our social and political circumstances is failing and, in fact, acting irresponsibly. The term Pearl uses to get at this demand system is the stranglehold of relevance. And I thought we might begin this evening with that. And so, uh, dear friends, would you say that the interest that many people had in Nadine Gordimer over many decades had mainly to do with her way of furthering the revolutionary struggle and that she was in that sense, an instance of the stranglehold of relevance. So I I put that to the two of you as a way to get started here. Um, I I might start by saying that I um that that I think she, her career was so long, um and that it evolved and she evolved as a writer also and she evolved in her uh political identif self identifications and and self understandings i think and and in fact you know one of the things that's that seems to me sort of extraordinary um because this was before my time so i you know i it's something that i came to understand is that she was publishing from the very early 50s she was publishing in american magazines um including the new yorker um but but a number of other the yale review i think a number of american magazines from very early on um and and that surely was not uh common for uh south african writers uh, young i mean quite young south african writers at that time and so um so 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 I think even I mean there is in her case th there are many layers. There's the fact she was she was already a, a writer of a fiction writer of note and of record um, before perhaps people were fully aware of her as a as a um, as in some way somebody um, writing if you will almost emblematically about the 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 white left um in in south africa but by the time i was aware of her as a writer um when i was young in the 80s um i, I think there's certainly a, a a case to be made that she was um suffering from the stranglehold of, of relevance that that one of the reasons we were aware of her and i think it may be difficult for young people right now to understand or appreciate how important that discourse about South Africa and and the fight against apartheid was um, at the time that I was a student. When I was an undergraduate at my university, there was a there was a, um, Winnie Mandela City, a tent encampment outside the uh, the largest dining hall that was there for I want to say two years with demonstrations, protesters trying to get the university to divest um, mm. their, their investments in South Africa. It really was the, the sort of central focus of a lot of student activism um, when I was young. So, so that's how I came to her as a writer in that context. And, and, and I, I was not aware um, uh, mm. till much later of, of, of the work that she had written, you know, long before that. So. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I, I completely agree with Claire that this, when we were growing up, that's to say, when we were sort of coming of age in the in 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 the eighties, uh, late eighties and early nineties, uh, and I was first beginning to write 
reviews. Um, the, 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 the politics and plight of South Africa was absolutely, I mean, in Britain too, was absolutely central. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that Mrs. Thatcher broke with the rest of the Commonwealth in objecting to sanctions. Um, that was her sort of conservative stance, um, and she stuck by it. She argued that economic sanctions punished everyone and achieved little. Um, and it, it was right through the 80s that was a, a, a constant sort of internal British political um, uh, discussion. Um, yes, it was an absolutely def defining political um, issue of of the time. And the question, Bob, you ask is, is to what extent has the eclipse of Gordimer's reputation, to what extent is it tied to that context? Um, I think before you answering that, you'd have to say that she's not the only writer these days to be suffering from um, a kind of advanced irrelevance, should we say, right? For every Gordimer, there's a, you know, we can think of three or four other, I mean, you know, it, 15 years ago, if you walked into a classroom and you said um, the name Ian McEwan, mm -hmm. um, thanks to atonement, uh, everyone knew who you were talking about. If you say now Ian McEwan, it's not clear that anyone will have read him. And in a few years time, it may be the case that no one's ever even heard of him. Uh, this is a, just an accelerated um, uh, pace of sort of, of literary obsolescence that we're all having to... Uh, to deal with. Gordimer is a particular uh, casualty of that, perhaps as you suggest, because of the this 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 the connect the ways in which her, her work were, were connected to to her her political circumstances. Ah, great. Yeah, and in fact, when I when I um, read that passage of of uh, Jed Pearls, and I uh, and I thought about Gordimer, I thought, well, uh, I don't think um, Gordimer herself would ever felt have felt that she was herself um, caught in the stranglehold of relevance. Uh, she was writing about what she was interested in and what she was passionate about. Uh, she she didn't write what she wrote because she wanted to appeal to to people who were had a, a special interest in the politics of South Africa. It's what she was. It's the life she lived. Um, but in some way, I think what we're getting at here is is that the stranglehold of relevance may have something to do with the audience, with with the readership and so on, uh, that it is we who find it difficult, right, to remain deeply invested in the work of writers um, who seem to us um, compelling and important because they were writing about things we were interested in, um, right. all apart from their, you know, virtues as, as novelists, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, well, let me ask another question that's related to this and, and, and it's related to something. Unless, Claire, you want to jump in there? Well, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I think she's somebody if you if you um, read interviews with her or, or essays of hers, she's somebody who who felt that that her writerly self was paramount and that 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 she had a, a political activist self um, and she was engaged in actual, you know, ANC activism, but that that was separate you know, that was distinct from her work and, and that she was writing about people um, who were living under apartheid or who had lived under apartheid and, and, and were in, the, and, and that's the degree to which her work was political, right? It wasn't about um, forwarding some, you know, putting forward some particular political message. And I, and I have to wonder whether um, that complexity or that nuance is part of what makes her a challenging writer for people in this moment perhaps i don't you know right that in that sense it, in, in that sense it, it, you can interestingly use her against jed pearl's trotsky thing about you know literature furthers the revolution because um yes her activism activism was certainly uh, about furthering the revolution and and she was willing to be you know arrested and censored and so on for that um you know i think she she joined the anc when it was still a a, a an illegal organization. Um, but it's an interesting question as to whether her writing 
could be said to further the revolution, um, given that her writing is actually often about ambiguous, first of all, that it's often about white South Africans or liberal white South Africans in relation to secondarily black South Africans. Um, and secondly, that it's often about, um, it's actually often about ideological failure. Uh, it's about the inability uh, of two sides to to make connections with each other, precisely the, the inability to to get together and 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 create the promised utopia. Yeah, no, I I agree. In fact, I mean the uh, the question I wanted to follow with uh, grows out of something that um, um, she said in an interview we conducted with her many years ago, uh, 40 years ago. Um, and we, we, was ask, we were asking her why, um, in spite of the fact that uh, her books were briefly banned, um, and why, in spite of the fact that she was threatened on numerous occasions with house arrest and that sort of thing, um, in fact, she was able to continue doing her work uh, to move in and out of, of South Africa at a time when other dissidents were not permitted to travel around and leave the country and speak at public forums in the way that um, she did. Um, and sh sh she said, well, of course, one factor was the support she received from writers all over the world um, who protested any, any threats that were made against her. But she also said that um, she had a sense that her own books were, and this is a quote, she says, were actually difficult books. Um, she said of Berger's Daughter, you can hardly call it a rabble-rousing book. Um, mm. It was clearly, she said, unlikely to inflame the masses. Um, and so anyhow, you know, I, I, you know, this is a question that sometimes when I think about difficulty in a book, that, that, uh, uh, that I find myself discussing with my students when I'm teaching Gordimer's novels in my classes. So I thought to ask um, you whether you thought that um, that Nadine was in fact a a, a difficult writer. Hmm. James, I'll let I'll let you take that question first. <laughs> I, I think I I think any writer is difficult who who takes on. Um, Questions of uh, questions of ideological struggle, and also who takes on sort of questions of transition. That's to say, she's she's often interested in 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 the question of what will become uh, of South African society when and if um, the promised um, utopia occurs. What will happen in that passage between? Uh, a, a corrupt, um, stable, um, uh, in unjust society, um, and a unknown, um, new, longed for, unjust society. Um, mm -hmm. That's always going to be. That's going to be. That's going to be a difficult terrain to cross. And I think any writer who, who looks honestly at that, and then second, second. Second to that, looks honestly at um, the ambiguities, shall we say, and contradictions, um, uh, sometimes hypocrisies, of liberal privilege um, is not going to offer, um, you know, is is, not, is 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 likely to be quite friendless. It seems to me as a as a writer, right? That's a that's a difficult it's a difficult thing to do, and I, I it's an interesting question. When you look at someone like Gordimer, who are the who exactly? You look around now. Who are the writers who are writing in this specific way? Right, there are there are easy ways to to make fun of uh, uh, of of liberal error, mm -hmm. um, and there are easy ways to um, to produce manifestos for a promised utopia. But who is looking in complex ways at the moment um, about? sort of varieties of ideological failure. That's what, that, what really interests me about her work. Mm -hmm. I, I, might, I might jump in if I, on a sort of slightly other note, which is I, I, um, I think, you know, it, it, again, the, the, the sort of length of her 
career. I mean, there's also a stylistic evolution. And I think she became an increasingly, I mean, in, in literally just a sort of stylistic sense, she became an increasingly difficult writer. There's a sort of compression and, mm. um, and, and maybe not quite fragmentation, but, but, uh, but, but, I was reading, rereading some of the early stories and, and they're, they're wonderful and they're very beautiful, but they do have a sort of um, Trevor, William Trevor, like um, huh. lucidity and sort of um, evenness of, of tone hmm. um, that I feel that um, in varying degrees, the stories that we're looking at this evening would all, I think, come into a later period. I mean, the soldiers embrace is the earliest of them, but they're all later stories. And, and you can see in, 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 in the, 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 the com compacted nature um, of the free and direct style, that the way that it's working. Um, mm. and, and it does require attention from a reader. You can't, you can't sort of, you know, whip through it, uh, in the bathtub or, you know, um, in a noisy coffee shop, you actually have to pay attention to the way she's deploying language and, and, and its meanings because it's quite layered. So I think she's difficult, not, not just in terms of import, but I think she's, she's a challenging writer in that sense in, in that she is precisely because, because things are nuanced and layered but also she's done, uh, you know, I, 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 when I'm teaching, I try to say, say to my students, you know, you want to, it's like a soup. You want to, you want to sort of dis, distill it. You want to boil it down and make it intense and, and very flavorful. Right. Mm -hmm. So that it's not watery and spread out. And, 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 and her, her, her work is absolutely that um, in the best literary sense. I mean, you know, um, but, but it does, it, it isn't easy. No, no, I agree. In fact, I mean, I, one one of the questions. It's it's of course in some ways it just sounds like a a, a sort of a standard academic question. But in the case of Gordimer, um, you you don't address it in a standard academic way. One of the questions we're always looking at together in a classroom when we have a a Gordimer text in front of us is, um, whose point of view is it? Uh, that we're getting in this passage. How different is it from the point of view we're getting uh, in this other passage two pages later? Um, why is there no transition from the one to the other? And I mean, that's, and that's a sort of a consistent sort of element, I think, in the readerly attention that you were describing, Claire, that, you know, that we, we have to pay when we read her. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, um, which, which, which is, um, which rewards the effort. Um, yeah. You know, it, uh, it, it, it is, it, it is um, thrilling to read these stories, but it is, um, but I think the, the marriage, if you will, of the difficulty of, of, of content, right. That there aren't easy answers and there aren't easy solutions. And there, um, there isn't a sort of um, either rosy or, simple, simply dark, um, you know, uh, uh, worldview, you know, um, and then you add that the sort of stylistic intensity to that. And, and it's true. It's, you know, it's, it, it's, I, I remember this is, this is a digression, but I remember, um, the writer, uh, Rachel Cohen telling me that she had, this is some years ago, but that she had been looking at, um, she was for a project rereading Sontag's work and was looking just at the sentence structures of, of her work in the sixties, right through to her, you know, late work. And she said, you know, the sentence structures become simpler. She's becoming deliberately more accessible. It's something that she wanted to, to, to do is to reach more readers. And, and in a funny way, I, I mean, it's not that these, the sentences are syntactically difficult, but, but the, but the density of the prose is sort of the opposite in, in Gordimer's case, right? It, it isn't becoming easier. It's becoming, it's becoming more demanding of the reader, I think. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Well, you know, um, I, I think we will come back to this kind of conversation. I, I think we'll have time to do it. 
but maybe we ought to to do this other thing, which is to uh, to turn to stories. And I want people who haven't read the stories who are with us in this audience not to uh, to fear uh, that they won't be able to follow the conversation because um, each of us will in turn, uh, when it comes to the story where we're dealing with, say something to to sort of summarize the story, and then we'll sort of talk around it. Um, so I think uh, James, if you don't mind, if you uh, or James or, or Claire, who's going to start? I think Claire, are you going to start first with mission statement. I, I'm happy to start if that's um, if that's helpful. Um, I, unless James, well, let's start with mission statement, which which is the longest, of course, of the stories that um, that we we um, we have before us, and it, it was published in. Um, it was in the collection in 2003. I'm not actually sure when it was, um, it may have been, in a, was it published separately? I'm not sure of the date if so. Um, but it it has as its protagonist, a woman named Roberta Blaine Nay Cartwright, um, who who has come to, um, to an unnamed uh, African country um, to uh, be the assistant to, the administrator of an of an NGO, of an international aid agency, and um, and her her boss is someone named Alan Henderson, and his wife is named Flora. Um, and at first, we know only that she, we know only that she is in uh, in Africa, posted in Africa for the first time, having been posted in a number of other countries around the world, um, and uh, only over time, perhaps. Um, I'm I am I am telling this out of order, but only over time do we come to understand that her grandfather um, was a colonial. She is British, and that her grandfather was a colonial in this uh, in this country. And in fact, that th there's a paragraph story um, that opens a, a sort of mini story that opens the short the, this piece that you, you don't have a context for until much later, and then you understand that it is a family story that was told by her grandfather and involves um the master of of uh, the, ma the the master at the manager's house so the white uh landowner sending um sending his uh servant um his black servant to walk uh 50 miles to town to um carry back liquor uh a box of liquor on his head every week um so he has to walk and then walk back um and and it's a sort of um the it says the feet was a famous dinner party story each weekend that's my man what heads they have a eh? thick as a log and we don't know if, in where that what that has to do with the story that we're reading until fairly far into the into the story um and and it's about her her um nascent and developing first a, a business relation or, or semi-business relationship and increasingly friendship and then eventually romantic relationship with um with a uh, a man whose role is the deputy director of land affairs um for, in in the country's government and his name is Gladwell Shadrach Shabruma and um he uh initially is very for a long time is very formal um but we follow we follow various uh visits first uh first they have drinks then he comes to visit her at her house then he uh takes her on a day outing to his uh his uncle's property then he takes her to his country house where she expects to meet his wife he does have a wife but does not meet his wife um and and by the end they become they become lovers and at the end of her posting um he suggests that they get married and she she says oh i would never want to cause a divorce and he um and he he says no I, it's not a divorce i had in mind i i uh i thought you could be my second wife that's our tradition um and it, and and at that point she speaks to flora henderson and to alan henderson about this uh and they they are oddly um they are, they they are they seem oddly in favor of this she can't countenance it um and and takes offense at this at this proposal but but they both i think thinking that um there 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 would be advantages 
on both sides. This woman is in her 40s and is unmarried, and um, this this would give her a, 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 an interesting life and a place in the world and standing and so on. Um, but but it's it's worth saying that 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 um, and there are lots of other things to say about it. But it's worth saying that she has um, after a moment of intimacy after they've had sex, um, she has divulged to him the the fact that that his um, the history of her grandfather and the fact that that um, that Gladwell Shabruma's property is very near where her grandfather's property was near something called Buffalo Mine, and he has said to her. Um, he he has granted her absolution. He said that has nothing to do with you. You know, she's ashamed of this terrible history. And he said that has nothing to do with you. It was the tradition. And she has this thought as she's pondering his proposal. And she thinks he granted me, um, he granted me absolution as it were. And I, meanwhile, when I'm confronted with his tradition, I indict him. But, um, but she, but she does, she will leave the country. She is going to go. So yeah. that's, that's a, a, a longish, sorry, maybe too long summary of the story. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you want to jump in with there, James? I, I, I have some yeah. questions. You might want to. Well, just as Claire was talking, what I was admiring was this, was just this, this formal, you know, this formal symmetry in a way that, that Gordon is so good at. I don't just mean the obvious thing of white woman, black African, um, they become lovers. Will they marry? Uh, no, they won't. Um, she comes, in, you know, she has a history through her grandfather of a, a sort of an inheritance, as it were, uh, a colonial inheritance, but she's now coming as the kind of modern manifestation of that uh, in terms of, um, you know, aid agency work and so on. Um, yeah, but it, it it wasn't so much that it was just the, what Claire how Claire was describing it as the as this as the as the moment when they're in bed and she starts to to weep and she tells him about she just tells him about her grandfather and this story of sending the man fifty miles and she's she's crying out of shame and guilt and so on and he this patterning the way in which he absolves her uh, uh, and then she indicts him uh, at the end of the uh, of the of the story um is i think just quite beautifully done and as claire was saying the the you, you could see you can see all the ways when i lay it out like that this is what's so fascinating about fiction generally right if i lay it out like that it sounds like a it sounds like i've made a very neat little ideological schema Right. I've set it all up and, you know, but in fact, the the whole question of of her marrying him at the end is really subtly handled because it seems self-evident to him. It's just like, I'll marry you. You you will get married. It's it seems strange and almost outrageous to her. Right. Which is that's not going to happen at the same time, as Claire was saying, her 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 white boss, Alan and Flora, his wife. Are very in favor of it, but for but for a mixture of reasons, one of which has to do with just the which she doesn't know, which has to do with the fact that they just think, well, she's 47, she's on the shelf, she just better it would be better for her if she just got married, right? She doesn't know that. They give official ideological reasons. Um, it would be, you know, be interesting for you. Um, he needs a a, a a wife, he's going to become a minister in the in the in the new government, he needs a wife of status who he can take to parties, you or you or she. Um, and so on. But actually, it's a wonderfully complex um, ideological uh, cat's cradle that's going on at the end, which I, I, I really liked. If I might just jump in, because it wasn't something I, I, I mentioned earlier, but but there, I mean, there's there is a sort of feminist layer to this story also, because she is the assistant and and her Canadian boss makes every effort to consult her and include her opinion. And, th and this over time alters the way that she's Treated by the other, um, by the by the government uh, employees and and other aid people that they encounter, um, and 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 it's there's a moment where it's 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 wonderfully a passive construction I think where it says it's noted that she 
that she drinks scotch rather than the beer that, you know, I mean, so, so she sort of distinguishes herself as a hard liquor woman, you know, that, and that, that makes her closer to the lads, you know, but, but, but there is as part of this, he is always um, Gladwell Shabruma is very calm and quite reserved, but also quite assertive. And re repeatedly, he doesn't say, um, shall we get married? He says, I will marry you. Mm. And 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 that's the culmination of a whole lot of moments where he is he is um, taking initiative and 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 sort of making statements, and 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 she is both, and and, and I think um, Gordimer captures very well um, Roberta's ambivalence about that. That 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 on on the one hand she's loving it, on the other sometimes she's like, huh, I, I don't, I, is that what I I don't know if that's what I want. Yeah, that's great. There's there's um, there's one moment um, in in the story when uh, Flora, um, her, her Roberta's boss's wife, um, observes that um, Gladwell's wife is not and this is the word, not an asset. She's not an asset, mm -hmm. uh, and the sense is that um, when if you marry this man, you will become an asset, and you will become someone who can think of herself um, in that way, in a way that perhaps you have not been quite ready to do up until now. She has thought of herself at various points in the story as very decidedly a subordinate, not a person who's terribly ambitious, who has a great sense of herself as destined to rise in the hierarchy and of the of the aid organization and so on. And, and this is in, in that sense, an opportunity to become truly an asset. And, and I think you're right, Claire. I mean, I, 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 I read that also as a kind of a feminist element in, in the way the story was conceived. Um, Absolutely. Um, and there's another thing I might add, which is, is, is that's a thread. It's just a thread through the piece, which is about property and, and, and the way when Roberta arrives and she moves into a, a house that has been, you know, it's a house for, uh, for visiting NGO people, right? And there's this, and there's this uh, sense of the impersonality of it, the ghosts of the previous people with the hangers. She knows she's picked the right best, the right bedroom because it's the one where the previous person's hangers are still in the cupboard. It's, mm. it's the one that the, the the previous person chose also. But then there's this little aside, which is that the uh, housekeeper and the and the um, I'm not sure if he, the, the, there's a man who takes care of the property. Um, that the, they they are um, they are delivering. They're behaving as though it's a home, and they they plant flowers and they take care of it as though it's a home. And these are, of course, um, you know, local black employees who are who are creating a sense of 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 of, of density or texture in this kind of weird ghost house. But but I mention it because later, um, what when she's thinking about what she'll miss when she leaves, she says, "I'll miss I'll miss his farm. I'll miss mm -hmm. his country house. That's what I'm going to miss. Where I can go and ride a horse and be free and right and 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 of course the peculiar dark irony, not stressed by Gordimer, but totally present, is that of course that's the precisely colonial land that her grandfather had claimed right on which so the thing that she's going to miss is exactly the same thing that her grandfather um left behind you know mm. came and claimed and left behind so um so it, it, you know she manages even in that sort of it's not a big thread but that thread through the narrative she manages to make all sorts of points about how territory is working and land is working um for the different people uh in this place yeah yeah that's mm. great Mm. Um, well, there's, obviously, there, there's so much more um, we can say, but uh, and maybe we maybe we'll circle around back to uh, to mission statement. But I thought, James, maybe we would move to uh, a soldier's embrace, and then absolutely move forward. So this is, this is an, a, a, an earlier story published in in 1982. Um, like a mission statement, it's also set in an unnamed country. Um, it's interesting how spare uh, often Gordimer's fiction is with with that kind of local texture. She quite quite likes the the 
the, the, the nameless or placeless, or not placeless exactly, but un, unnamed allegory, allegorical place. Um, so it's set in an in a, a unnamed um, uh, African country where there has recently been a, there, is the, there has recently been a ceasefire after a, a war between uh, colonialist soldiers and, um, and, and black indigenous freedom fighters. Um, and it centers on a white lawyer husband, a white lawyer uh, and her and his wife. Um, and the story begins with the they're, they're not named. Um, the story begins with the wife um, sort of walking into the town square as extraordinary celebrations to celebrate the ceasefire have erupted. And the title of the story comes from the fact that she is embraced suddenly on both sides by a white soldier and a black soldier who are each just happy that that the thing's over that war is over and peace has been called and in their excitement they 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 give her a, a, a hug and it's one of many ways in which this story is beautifully put together because that's the that's our first and most important image and it's clearly a, a utopian one and over the course of what's actually a pretty short story, we are going to see that it's an impossible utopian one too. In other words, it, it begins as a as iconic and slowly begin it slowly it, it steadily fades away as an impossibility. But initially, things look good um, for this white couple. They've been at the center of the struggle for black independence. Um, the White lawyer is and his wife are friendly with many of the main figures of the of the of, of what will be the new government, um, and it's only over the course of, of 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 several months that they begin to realize that possibly they have don't have much relevance to go back to our our word they don't have much relevance um, they don't have the relevance they hope for um, for this uh, new black government. Um, the lawyer thinks maybe he'll get a professorship. There's some talk about how he might be involved in drafting the new constitution. Nothing comes of it. Um, a friend of theirs, a young man who had been a, a protege of theirs, um, called uh, Chipande, um, who looks as if he's going to be a big fish in the new government, uh, comes over to the house. And they're, of course, very excited and, and they want to celebrate this victory with their black friend, um, but suddenly he's full of uh, a kind of self-importance or just distraction, whatever. Um, he, he he makes it clear that he doesn't have a great deal of time. He's not going to stay for dinner. Um, there'll be an official photograph. And and he sort of leaves the house saying, you know, I, I, I'll, you don't call me, I'll call you. <laughs> but the calls don't come. Um, and meanwhile, people that they knew or knew just in terms of like the butcher, you know, the white butcher, uh, start drifting, uh, drifting away. Um, and life looks a little more difficult and um, aimless politically for them than, than they'd ever expected. Um, so that when eventually the husband, the lawyer husband gets a call from a neighboring country, um, white minority ruled uh from a from someone in, in 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 that country who says come and join our law firm there's there's great liberal work to be done here over the border uh where your where your where your work will be appreciated they decide to leave um and so they pack things up and uh and they say farewell to 21 years of existence in uh, a single house and that's where the story ends. Great. Um, did you want to uh, add anything there, Claire, before I yeah. ask you or something? I, I might add a tiny thing, which is that they're threaded throughout. There, there are a couple of their other relations. Um, one is the um, Muchanga, who's the who is the man that they employ to take care of the house. Yeah. And, um, and it actually ends with him. Um, yes. at the very end so they because they have set him up 
to be a, a, a sort of merchant or a, or a peddler, I guess. They've get, got him a cart and some um, a hawker's license, a hand cart and stocks of small commodities. And and um, he's he's somebody who's been having trouble adjusting to this new, um, the, the new situation. He was at first afraid to go into town, but he seems to have sort of um, got used to things. But they are aware um, as they leave him that that he may not prosper. That that the difficulty of getting um, uh, restocking his wares will may prove um, it may prove impossible, and that he may he may end up with nothing. Um, and and so he's waving them goodbye the way he always did when they went on vacation. Mm, um, yes, but they're not going on vacation; they're leaving for good. Yeah, it, yeah. it really is a. It really is a. I think a, a, a. It seemed to me almost a perfect story, a, a perfect way of how to do this kind of, whatever this kind of thing is. I don't. I think it's pretty sui generis, but, but this kind of, nameless, you know, characters who are the white characters not named, an, a nameless, an unnamed country, um, you know, to, to, of a way of doing this, allegorical and yet densely realistic story at the same time i think it, it's just perfect because every claire mentioned um muchanga the 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 housekeeper and servant i mean the the and gardener he is too the 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 way in which he uses I mean, every single detail for instance the the wife likes to um look after her tropical plants um and uh, Early on in this story, as she's telling her husband about this experience that she had in the square with the with the embrace from the two two soldiers, she's described as um, wiping little green fly off the leaves with uh, a tissue that's been soaked in in gin, and then a few pages later, uh, when Muchanga is doing exactly the same thing, Gordima writes. They looked at Muchanga. He was doing something extraordinary. He was using gin to kill the green fly on the on the leaves. She says, "You can't do that. Gin's in great, in very short supply. You should use any old rubbing alcohol." So it's fine for the mistress to do it, but it's not okay for the servant to do it. Um, it's it's things like that. Just really excellent um, use of every single detail. Claire mentioned the thing about him waving at the end as they used to, as he used to wave at them when they went away on holiday. Everything is worked out perfectly. It's a beautiful structure. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to, uh, to just to ask you about a particular thing that uh, uh, it's sort of a strange moment. Um, it's it's on the last page of the story um, uh, when the husband, the the lawyer husband, is telling his wife that um, their friend. Chipande, um, who's about to, as you described it, James, take a position in the new government and so on, uh, has been pleading with them not to leave. Um, and when it became clear that uh, he would not be able to prevent them from leaving, he actually cried, uh, the husband reports, right? He cried. And to which the wife says, I know. That's what I've always liked so much about them. Whatever they do, they feel. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's close quote. And then the next line reads, the lawyer made a face. There it is. It happened. Hard to believe. Mm -hmm. That's it. There's no more, um, there's no more on, on that observation that the wife uh, made uh, you know it, it, it's a that's what they're like observation. Anyway, mm -hmm. I ask you about that and about Gordimer's wanting to put that there on the last page of of this beautiful story. Yeah, I I, I mean I I was struck by it too, and and in fact, taking the taking the prompt of your question, Bob. I mean I I was sort of thinking earlier today. Maybe she didn't need to have that line, right? Yeah. Maybe the maybe the maybe the story would be even stronger without it because we already get a sense there's a certain amount of liberal entitlement. I think when the when the friend Chipande is introduced, they say 
he'd been a sort of protege to them, but they didn't like to use that term. It smacked of patronage. And you think, okay, I think I have the idea of what these people are like, They're perfectly decent, perhaps a little self-congratulatory, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, but also at sea, they're in over their heads in some way. This is the history is, is marching on ahead of them in ways that they're not able to, to keep up with. And maybe one didn't quite need that line, but it's, on the other hand, it's sort of breathtakingly honest as a, for, for her as a writer or daring for her to put, to put in. There's a similar moment in, in mission statement where um, you'll remember she's making the, the, the tri trip with, with her soon to be lover to, to the uncle's uh, a farmhouse and they stop at a at a small village to get some soda and she's in the car he goes into the the shop and the car is immediately surrounded by poor kids who are basically wanting a little bit, bit of money um and and from the perspective of roberta gordima writes something like um poor children they're always the same children yes and it's just again one of those sort of daring moments where particularly by contemporary standards, I think contemporary writers would probably be editing that stuff out. Yeah. Um, but an honest writer sticks with the limitations of her character and isn't afraid um, by, by, the, by, the, by the politically offensive. Right. And, and I, think, I think what's interesting to me about that moment is um, the, the, I mean, both of those moments, but the one Bob, that you referred to is that, I mean, you do as a reader, you're like, ooh, right? Mm. And 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 mm. um and it's hard, it is the wife, it's the wife who says it, and and it's hard not to somehow associate that character with the author in right, the, who is who is a, a a privileged white liberal South African who um and and, and yet of course. I think I think Gordimer would herself be outraged <laughs> by any reader making that association because you know at, at various moments I think in the seventies she would say I despise liberals I'm a radical you know I mean and this is this is a comment on liberals you know it, it, she would distinguish herself powerfully from such a character but 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 somehow with the passage of time um, that and and maybe with distance geographical dis distance also i think it becomes easier to um somewhat conflate the two which makes um which makes i think the 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 makes it only more uncomfortable oh, yeah. Which, mm. I mean, yeah one of my students in in my class the other day when we were doing this story um in in fact uh, cited it and and was uncomfortable about it and we we then looked at the fact that Gordimer had after all added the the lawyer's response right the right. lawyer to the face there it is it happened hard to believe so I I mean I would myself I mean as a reader I would be much more inclined to associate Gordimer with with the, the husband lawyer's response of than, course. Yeah, uh, but um, but 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 I but I think that you know it, that that's back to the earlier conversation about her being difficult. Yes. Um, you, know, you actually have to pay attention. You actually have to take that in, and you actually have to consciously make the distinction. You know, make. I, I think we live. You know, we live it. We live in an era of um, of auto fiction, right? And there's that there there's a a much readier uh, uh, leap by a reader. Um, towards towards the autobiography or, or you know of the author than there, than there was even 40 years ago you know right. I, I think it's something that 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 can happen unthinkingly yeah no, I agree mm -hmm. I agree mm -hmm. well if you don't mind I'm going to jump to to the last of the stories um which is a, um, a late story um called Alice for Lauren all is lost right um uh, it is, for those of you who haven't read the story, uh, it's a third person story, though it is rooted throughout in the consciousness or the subjectivity of a woman um, of a certain age, an academic, a historian, South African, who regularly thinks of herself as a survivor after the recent death of her husband of many years. Her grief has her remembering things in the story, sexual pleasure, intimacies, confessions, 
previous marriages in their very early lives. But also one thing her dear husband had told her about, a brief homosexual affair he had had before the two of them had met decades in the past. Whom to talk to about that, she asks herself again and again. Uh, and of course, you know, obviously the one, one question we have as readers as we read this is, you know, wh why now uh, do you want to, um, to ask someone about this after decades of, of marriage, um, now that her husband is gone? Um, and so uh, she goes to track down the other man, an architect in London, elderly now, but still attractive. When they meet, she is somewhat taken aback to learn that the affair had been somewhat more important than her man. That's how she refers to her, her husband, than her man um, had given her to understand. Her sense uh, in this visit, in her encounter with the architect, um, is that her man's lover, the architect, was giving her too much information and thus somehow violating the terms upon which they had agreed to, to speak. Uh, the words nothing personal um, is repeated uh, a few times, um, you know, nothing personal. And yet she feels like she's getting something actually quite personal, or at least seems so to her. Um, so she had felt um, that, that the, somehow their, their agreement had been violated. And in the end, when she leaves the architect, um, her final thought, um, very melancholy to say the least, um, is, uh, you know the one you knew, uh, you cannot know the other, any other, unless or Lauren is lost. So that's, uh, that's a, a very, very brief story, um, uh, sort of summary. This is a late story, as I mentioned, written right after the death of Nadine Gordimer's husband, Reinhold Kassira. It had been a long marriage, and though her husband was a very old man when he died, his passing was in uh, every way, obviously, momentous for Gordimer. Uh, I have two long letters from Gordimer uh, uh, in my files um, describing the sense of uh, unbearable loss and distress. Um, she she also sent me the manuscript of this story with another letter explaining that she wanted us to uh, to publish this story in our magazine Selma Gundy because she sort of felt good about placing it with people who had themselves been long married, which is a sort of a, a strange idea in a way. Mm. Um, but. Um, uh, just a few words about the, the nature of the story. Um, it is not, I think, clearly saturated in race or politics the way uh, so much of Gordimer's fiction is. And yet, in several respects, it seems to me um, a characteristic Gordimer story. Um, I mean, again, accepting that it's that it's not, that granting that it's not saturated in politics and race. Um, so how characteristic? In number one, it's um, relentless interiority um, in its acute sort of alertness to um, every aspect of the character's mood and expression. But most of all, um, in what I'm going to call its quirks and oddities, um, it's sort of very carefully orchestrated sentence fragments um, deliberate repetition of certain key words and phrases, um, and the sense through it all that no matter how much is said, there is um, much more that is sort of hinted at um, and merely uh, implied. There are even, and this is only the only sort of local particular I want to call attention to, and there are many others I, 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 I sort of tempted to speak about, um, for oddity sentence constructions and metaphors that seem wonderful and yet also maybe just a little bit, I'm going to use this strange word, off. Um, uh, I, I felt this in 
we go to murder at other times, but I'm thinking of it particularly at this moment in the story. Right up the very front of the story, there is this quote: "The long while continues, a chord that won't come full circle doesn't know how to tie a knot in resolution." Unquote. Right? It seems to me a, a tricky construction. Um, the cord that doesn't know how to tie a knot. Um, and so, you know, I get the sense of the, the, the grieving speaker plausibly reaching for language to express what at least is for her somewhat uh, inexpressible. Um, which, so that's, that, that's all I really should want to say just here initially about this, this story. But um, Claire, James, something mm. further. Uh, it's a it's a lovely story, and 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 what a what what a lovely thing that that she chose Salma Gundi for for such a person for a deeply personal, clearly, um, piece of fiction. Um, I was struck. I, I I said this to Claire. I think yesterday when when we were talking about these three stories, I was struck that all three of them have to do with people stepping up to a, about to step up to a kind of resolution which would be joining themselves with someone else communicating with another and all of them leave move away from that situation say farewell um in in two of the stories i think it, this is one of them um uh, no, it's the other two stories that the, the it's almost identical line about how she didn't have the, the they didn't have the right words. Wow. Um, and and you could say for this story in some ways at the end too, that these two people are not quite finding the right words uh, on which to agree on which to yeah find common ground to talk about uh, talk about the their their mutual lover. So um I, I was just struck by that, that sort of, and then, and then I suppose thinking about that, I was wondering how generally pessimistic we should consider the line about you know the one you know and you can't know the other. Um, and maybe that's a little unfair to to go from that line to everything in you know politically, racially, and so on. But I just don't know. It may, it may, it, st- it got me thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I, I think you're right. You want to jump in at all, Claire? There. Um, you know, I, I, just to come back to the line that you uh, that you pointed to in the sort of strange uh, strange metaphor that that personifies the chord. I mean, I mean, it's 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 a rather it's it really is quite um, quite strange. Um, but but it is about as you say. I mean, the rest of that very small paragraph is so whom to talk to speak um and there's nobody you know there is this sense yeah i mean i remember years ago in my um in my shakespeare class as an undergraduate um i I, and i can't even remember which professor it was pulling out um pulling out lines from different plays and saying um in lear um tis not the worst so long as we can say this is the worst that's that's not as dark as it gets as long as you can say this is the worst that's not as dark as it gets but in timon of athens um there's a line in timon that i'm going to misquote but but the line is um you know let me say this then let language cease yes. yeah. and that that is the darkest that is the darkest that there can be is is the mm. complete breakdown and failure as long as we have language we have something and so i think you know here there is this sense of well, what is language without an interlocutor? Yeah. What 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 is it to speak if you if nobody can hear you if you're not communicating to anyone? And that, in some way, is what this story is, is addressing. And mm. so, the, so as you say, the sort of breakdown of metaphor in that respect makes makes some. I mean, it's not that there's no meaning there; it's that that meaning isn't so accessible to us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, I agree. 
Well, uh, we have we have of course uh, so many other things we we could say, uh, but I think we want to um, to allow um, invite Adam Braver to uh, to give other people um, who are with us uh, this evening to to ask questions if they have some questions to ask. Um, so, Adam, would you like to to do that? Yeah, we have. Uh... No questions at the moment. You can type questions into the, the Q&A, um, which would probably be the easiest um, way to go, unless somebody has a very specific question you want to ask, um, which we could call on you as well. Well, while we're waiting for someone to, to type in a, a question, let, let me put a, a, a question that seems to me, um, you know, a, a sort of a more general question that that takes us back to some of our earlier conversation and so on. I was thinking of a, um, of a, a moment um, when uh, in, in the novel Berger's Daughter, um, where um, the two young women um, who, uh, who are both um, the children of what are called the faithful, um, which is to say um, the white uh, people who have been fighting uh, on behalf of, of the overthrow of the white apartheid government, um, some of whom go to prison, die in prison, like Rosa Berger's father, uh, Lionel Berger. Um, and uh, and uh, the one young woman, they're in their early 20s, um, uh, asks Rosa Berger to do something simple, um, to run off some uh, mimeograph um, flyers to be used in agitating for um, the overthrow of the government and so on. And, uh, and Rosa Berger uh, refuses. Um, uh, she refuses, she says, because we are such conformists um, as the children of our noble, faithful, wonderful parents. Um, so I mean that that passage, and like so many others in Gordimer, seemed to me to suggest how complicated is the relationship in Gordimer's work between you know, what might be called private concerns, um, personal concerns, psychological concerns, and political commitment or conviction. Um, you know what the other young woman says to Rosa Berger at that moment is. Um, Conformists, who, who cares, you know, about conformists? I mean, you know, there's the political uh, situation that that uh, that we're in. I mean, who cares whether we're conformists or not? And so anyway, I thought to sort of put that out there as a way of sort of suggesting, uh, you know, all of the different ways in which in the novels and the stories, Gordon complicates um, what would otherwise seem a pretty straightforward a political question. Should we or should we not um, work on behalf of overthrowing this intolerable system? No. Anyway, that's just, uh, I don't know if you if you felt that sort of thing in in any of the stories that we've uh, that we've looked at. I certainly think it's it's clearest in the three stories in a soldier's embrace, um, right? Yeah. Uh, that we're personal. Uh, well, I yeah. mean, I, yeah, I, th I think, it, you know, this is an, another um, another conversation um, that that actually James and I were having while walking a dog um, that um, but 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 but, you know, they're there. Um, I think she's somebody who rises remarkably to a particular challenge. I mean, she writes about the, um, in various places and spoke, I think, about the fact that, you know, you are, you are writing in your times, you know, you are given your subject, you're given your place in history. Um, and, and, and it's sort of not a choice. It's a thing that, that, that happens to you. Hang on. I'm, I have, I have here somewhere, I have a quote. Um, so she says, you know, it wasn't that it wasn't, um, she says about writing that she was a writer first, and then she says it was learning to write that sent me falling, falling through the surface of the South African way of life. Um, and then she says also in the introduction to her to her selected stories, um, 
She says, in a certain sense, a writer is selected by his subject, his subject being the consciousness of his own era. How he deals with this is, to me, the fundament of commitment, although commitment is usually understood as the reverse process, a writer's selection of a subject in conformity with the rationalization of his own ideological and or political beliefs. My time and place have been 20th century Africa. Um, and so, and so, uh, you know, um, in the context of, of other uh, white liberal South African writers, I mean, it is it is a sort of um, recurring conundrum, right? That you that you you have the these issues um, of 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 race and oppression and uh, and class and the terrible history and the you know you have all of these things that that in which by which you are surrounded and in which you are if you will, encased, right? Um, you can't escape them. And so, uh, you know, it, it's almost, um, as as writers of fiction, I think, you know, what we one tries as a writer of fiction not to put oneself um, narratively in a, in a, in a situation, um, in a binary situation, right? Where, the, where there are only two possibilities. Um, and, and I think, she, um, you know, when you're dealing with these politics, um, in the broadest sense, there are only two possibilities. There's a right side and a wrong side, right? So, so um, I think part of what's remarkable about Gordimer as a writer and about Kutsia and about, you know, Damon Galgut, about others who sort of are, uh, rise above that binary, as it were, um, or outwit that binary, is finding the ways in which, um, if you look at the whole self and the whole soul, um, enmeshed and entrapped in this um, inescapable situation. But you you can come to see almost as if you had a microscope. You can come to see the the, the really complex nuances and and um, and oddities, right, of of each individual experience. That it, it it isn't simply right. There's a good side and a bad side, right? It, it, it that may be overarchingly and fundamentally true, but but the realities of lived experience, which is what fiction is about, um, are are much more are much more complex than that. And 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 almost everyone is in some shade of gray, you know. That's great. Um, Bob, we have a couple of questions here. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, we have two from, I'm going to combine together from two of our Institute friends, Sheila Kohler and Liz, and Liz Benedict. Um, and the questions, and I'm going to try to put them together, so, um, is one is, do you feel that Kotsea is more red today than Gordimer, or does he also suffer from the same phenomena? And the follow-up uh, question, the, the, the related question that Liz asked is, you know, how do your students respond to Gordimer's work recently? Do you think they can appreciate it beyond the political world that she writes about? Um, and, and Liz brings up uh, um, it, being in the um, teaching Berger's Daughter and, and Iowa uh, Writers Workshop in 1993, uh, where the students found it uh, difficult um, and, and put off by it. And, you know, do you think there's any Gordimer work that might transcend the difficulties and maybe the ir uh, irrelevance, quote unquote, difficulties um, and irrelevance? But also this question is, you know, is Kotsea in the same um, place uh, in, in this conversation? Huh. Hmm. This is a great question. I, I mean, um, I, I, I teach a lot of both of those writers, so I, I do have some sense for the way students respond to them. Um, I think, you know, Kotsea's work isn't um, rooted in uh, time and place quite in the way that Gordimer's, most of Gordimer's fiction is. Um, and so in that sense, my own sense is that, that Kotsea is uh, being taught, at least, in lots of places that uh, where Gordimer's novels are no longer being taught. Um, I had numbers of colleagues who were teaching uh, Gordimer here uh, 25, 30 years ago, and, and that's no longer the case. I'm the only one you know, remaining who's doing that. But Kotsea, I think, is very still very widely read and taught. Um, but the difficulty uh, in 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 Gordimer is is considerable. I think my students my students 
um, can connect with with the Gautamer novels uh, that I teach. And there's one you asked, is there one? Yes, I think there's one uh, that, uh, and that is called The Pickup, uh, which is a rather a late uh, Gautamer novel. Um, it is not, although it, it, op it opens in South Africa, it moves off elsewhere. Um, in some ways, it's, it's a novel about globalization um and and race um and ethnicity and uh and i think students have a much easier time connecting with that than uh than with the novels focused on south african race and politics hey oh, yeah, that's my mm. sense of it yeah it's an interesting question the, the thing about i mean you, you want to talk about kutsir and gordimer together because they're two white south african writers who who dominated the last 30 years in contemporary literature and who both won the Nobel Prize. Um, and I agree with you, Bob. It's my feeling that Kurtzier at the moment, you know, if we're thinking about this as a sort of the literary market, you know, he sees there's more of him on the shelves, right? Um, quite literally. That's to say, I don't know what if you go into the local bookstore, what of Gordimer you're going to find, but you'll find disgrace, you'll find disgrace there. Um, though you may only find disgrace. Um, but I, 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 I think you're right that it's, at the moment, at least, Kurtzia's fortune is that he's always been formally quite various and uh, intriguing. So there are, there are more or less realist novels, or pretty realist novels like Disgrace. Um, there are early postmodern works like In the Heart of the Country, uh, which are really dense and difficult, uh, self-reflexive works um, and allegorical novels like *Waiting for the Barbarians* and so on. So it's it's it. There's there's a plus the 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 the, the memoir work, um, which is quite remarkable too. So there's there's quite a lot of cuts here to uh, to handle at the moment uh, in in a way that is is shall we say useful for him. <laughs> Well, yeah. it, it's it's interesting because it, uh, you know it's almost as though there's too much Gordimer, though. I mean, is it isn't? I mean, it's a it's a. Um, she wrote a great number of of novels and a great number of stories. I I, I mean, I some this is a completely unrelated conversation, but one does sometimes you know there's the Graham Greene effect, like what what. <laughs> What do you pick? Which which one? You know, and 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 um, it's interesting. It's interesting, um, Bob, that that the pickup is the one that you find students relate to because, of course, that's not considered. I think one of her canonical, you know, I mean, Berger's Berger's daughter is the is considered, the, you know, or July's people. July's I mean, people, yeah. Um, but and um, you know, there there are several others that come to mind. Um, you know, in a sort of firmament of of the ones that that one thinks of as defining her work, um, and and yet, um, you know, that isn't necessarily um, with t with time with time. You know, as we know, I mean, I at, at the moment examples are eluding me, but I know that you know if we go back to the nineteenth century, you know, there are novelists, there the works, there are particular works that were popular then that are not the ones that have that have uh, endured you know, over time. In fact, you know, that some of their least popular novels have become more popular um, for one reason or another. So, I mean, it, it's an interesting, um, I, but I think almost having too much to choose from um, can, can be challenging also. I agree. Mm. Um, mm. I'd say, I mean, James wrote, um, if I may say, a very great essay about um, Kutsay's Elizabeth Costello, um, and 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 that is a book that I teach um, all the time, uh, and which students, though it's very demanding work, students um, relate to that very very enthusiastically. Um, and so you know, it's I, I wouldn't have predicted that, but it is the case, you know. But, and that would be a good example because you know Elizabeth Costello is a, whatever it is is a sort of metafictional meta essay that is in part about fiction and realism, but also about animal rights, um, about death. You know, there's a, there's a, that, that you could see why uh, there's a, there's a lot to, there's a lot to get.
get into there. Um, but Claire mentioned, I mean, you know, we're thinking about the sort of the literary marketplace. Claire, Claire mentioned Graham Greene. I mean, this is proof that, that we don't even have to appeal to notions of of the stranglehold of relevance. Mm -hmm. um, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the, the, Graham Greene was about as big as it got. In, in in certainly in English fiction, but it, you'd probably say in worldwide fiction. He was often considered a potential Nobel Prize winner. Um, he, there was some ideal sweet spot that he'd hit of, of you know, entertainment and seriousness. Um, uh, even you didn't actually have to have read any Graham Greene to know the phrase that W.H. Auden made famous in one of his poems, Graham Greenish, to know that it was a certain, well, a certain green atmosphere was and that has literally gone it's just gone it's disappeared so maybe this just this this we we i mean we shouldn't lament it too much this is just the way the way cycles of literature literature move i don't know yeah no it's true um adam are there other um, questions you wanted to we've got two more questions um and i will uh we we'll, we'll, we'll probably cut them off there for the sake of time and i have a a closing sure. question for, for, for all of you as well. But one, uh, I'll ask you to, they, they're not really related, but maybe you'll relate them uh, as, you, as you think about them. Um, one is, what do we make of the fact that uh, Al Alva, Als Alsver Lauren is a foreign phrase that in fact comes from the label of an Afrikaner wine? So that's question one. Um, and then uh, the follow-up question to that is, uh, in, in your opinions, would you say that Gordimer was more interested in preaching her radical values or rather in dramatizing the difficulties and complexities of social protest? Mm. Yeah. My, well, my, might yeah. I leave in just on the second one? Because I think this first one goes to you, Bob, but I would just say she was pretty, she was quite explicit that, that her aim was the latter. Yeah. That, she was repeatedly explicit that her aim was the latter. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I mentioned once in, in, in essay when in uh, in the first interview that that uh, I did with a couple of other people with with uh, Gordimer uh, many years ago, I actually used the ex, um, the expression political novelist, um, uh, and Gordimer bristled. Uh, <laughs> And she said, I am not a political novelist. Um, and her sense was that a political novelist is by definition, uh, someone who has an ax to grind, um, someone who writes novels, if they're writing novels, to promote an ideology and so on. Uh, whereas she was the other kind of writer. Uh, she was using the novel as a way of discovering what she thought and felt about a whole variety of different things. Um, and so we, uh, that was an interesting sort of moment of, of public uh, chastisement and correction, uh, you know, and um, of course, I said I didn't. I didn't mean political novelist in that in that other sense. But she she was, as you say, Claire. She was very clear. That's not what she was about as a writer, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, and then the other question. Well, the Africana wine. I, you know, I think. Uh, I, I don't read uh, any political, any particular political uh, sort of intent um, there um, in the label. Um, she's bringing the wine with her to London from her own country. Um, and it's a gift, and so on. Maybe, maybe there's more to be made of that than uh, than than I've made of it. But I I, I didn't think of that as particularly um, significant in political. Um, terms, but maybe you maybe you guys did. I, I didn't. Yeah, is that okay? Yes. Yep. So let me ask my last question, and then we will um, carry on with the, the the rest of the evening for everybody. And and that is who who all of you think are the literary heirs of of um, of Gordon. I mean, obviously, to Damon Galga comes to mind. But maybe the literary is not necessarily even South African um, and, and having to be thinking um, in, in those terms. 
it's a hard yeah, well, uh, uh, Bob, what were you going to say? Oh, I wasn't. No, I was going to ask you guys. If you, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I actually was thinking sort of expansively away from what you were saying earlier about, you know, the, the correction political novelist. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the, you didn't mean it in that way, uh, and she didn't want it to be meant in that way. Um, mm-hmm. But it's hard to think of any decent novelist who isn't in some way of ambition, who isn't in some way also a political novelist. I don't see how you would be. You you mentioned earlier uh, the thing about likening her to, to Genev. And I was just, as you said that, I was just trying to think of 19th century Russian writing. You know, to be, an, to be a 19th century Russian writer was to be a political writer in one way or another. Tolstoy was a political writer, very much so. Um, and... Um, and not to the detriment of the work either. Um, so I, I think I'm dodging the question, really. I, I, I'm um, well. One writer who comes to mind might might be someone like Rachel Kushner, who, whose whose last novel was a quite densely researched uh, novel about a set in a women's prison uh, in California. Um, and um, I, I don't know that that makes her the heir of Gordimer, but it, but it's certainly a good example. I think Claire will think of other writers too, um, maybe a, a friend of ours from Germany, but um, there are, you know, one can think of writers like that who are working in a political vein because that's what needs to be done right now. Yeah. I, I, I was actually, um, as, as James surmised, I was I was going to mention Jenny Erpenbeck um, perhaps as, a, as, as someone who, uh, similarly, uh, is is writing the stories of her place in time and uh, geography. You know, she is she was born in what was then East Germany. She is um, she's in her fifties now. Um, you know, and, and she has written um, repeatedly from in different ways, from different angles about different aspects of the last, uh, you know, well, I guess the last 120 years, um, indeed, but certainly the last 50 years and sometimes about the present, you know, I mean, she's somebody who is, um, who's very much engaged in that way in, in a, in a, in, in evoking or channeling the complexities of the time, you know, Right. Yeah, and if if um, you uh, describe um, speaking about the complexity of the time as political, then I have to agree completely with uh, you know with James and, and in effect with, with what you're saying, Claire. But that you know all good writers of ambition um, are political writers in one degree or another. Uh, when I every year teach your book, Claire, the woman upstairs, um, that certainly raises all sorts of political questions. And, and everyone in the room is, is alert to that, you know, Mm. there's no, there's no getting away from it. Um, so I, I, I think that's true. I cannot think myself of, of, of any, contemporary writer who, at least in my sense of it, is writing in the Gordimer vein specifically. Mm. Mm. I just can't, I can't think of any. Um, yeah. Better off a woman, you know, uh, but, you know, I, I, I can't think of one. I mean, I, 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 yes, certainly Urban Beck isn't a writer of, sim, isn't similar to Gordimer as a writer. It's more that just, I mean, and I can think of several Others who who in very very different ways, um, uh, but are engaged. I mean, I think also of, of another friend of ours, a Colombian writer named Juan Gabriel Vasquez, um, and uh, you know he's somebody who's very much engaged with with writing into or through the the world in which he finds himself as a as a you know Colombian writer, and and um, you know there's a lot of politics and history there. Um, but 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 stylistically there's not a resemblance at mm. all. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. So uh so Adam, uh, is that have have we uh, successfully uh, evaded your question? 
Yes. I mean, it seems there's so many different ways to go. We could have a whole other conversation and yeah, all of the hour and a half just on this, although both of the names, Claire, that you both James and Claire were names also that came to my mind too, which which does you know make you think it is not necessarily an issue of style or subject, but of ethos or something that that mm. that's, that's carried on. Um Bob, I think we need to close the the, the evening um now. So First of all, I really want to thank uh, Bob and Claire and James for for, for participating in this. Um, and uh, um, it's really been wonderful. And Bob, I especially appreciate Bob was very kind to open his files of correspondences and manuscripts and so on of Nadine Gordimer's um, as, as uh, with some of our students who are working on preparing the exhibitions, um, as well as the pages of Salma Gundy and perhaps his conversation may very well find itself in the pages of Salma Gundy, uh, one, one might hope. Um, and would also like to, uh, again, as uh, Betsy noted at the beginning, uh, very much express our gratitude for uh, the donor uh, who endowed this program 23 years ago, uh, Robert Blaze, for, uh, for his gift, which allows such rich conversations um, such as this to happen. Um, and annually, and I will say for, uh, we hope to see you all next year at this time, the, the, the book we will be uh, focusing on is The Street by Ann Petrie, um, and, um, and looking at that, and whichever way we find ourselves looking at it. So again, thanks, Bob, Claire, James, and, um, and all thanks for all of you for attending tonight as well. Thank Great. you all. Thank, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you for all evening. Good evening. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Right.